Donald Trump and his defense team, along with the co-defendants, now move to appeal the disqualification order from Judge McAfee, or the non-disqualification order that actually came out. Of course, we know that he said to Fannie, pick one and make your decision, otherwise you're gone. And the decision was that Nathan Wade got booted out of here. Fannie is remaining. Hard to get rid of the biggest Fannie in Georgia. So the decision was pretty easy, pretty quick. We know that Fannie is going to remain. Nathan Wade has already resigned, and Fannie has accepted that resignation. But Steve Sadow and the defense have now announced they are moving this forward to appeal. And usually in criminal cases, the appeals come at the conclusion of the case, right? Most criminal cases are nice bundle up little criminal cases. Someone's charged with a crime. Whether the appeal happens in the middle or whether the appeal happens at the end, it doesn't really matter, right? It's all kind of boxed in on a criminal case. That's it. Now, if you add in additional issues like immunity, now the question becomes, is the entire prosecution in the first place even allowed because your immunity should preclude you from the prosecution. That's why we are on appeal in the other Trump criminal prosecutions. Similar things happening here. If Fannie Willis is corrupt from the beginning, from the core of this whole thing, if her secret relationship with Nathan Wade was in motion at the inception of this entire disgusting prosecution, birthed from these two, ugh, then it needs to go, right? Sorry, it's gotta go. The case has to be you know, terminated, gotta eliminate it because it's not capable of life to continue to play out this analogy. But it needs to go, right? And so Steve Sadow and the defense are saying we got to go all the way back to the very beginning and this all has to go. So here was his statement. He says, statement of Steve Sadow. And you should be following him, by the way. He's on X at Steve Sadow. He's the lead defense counsel for President Trump in Fulton County in the Georgia case. He says the following, President Trump and seven defendants have jointly filed a motion requesting the court to grant a certificate of immediate review, asking Judge McAfee to certify that this is an appealable issue so that they can take it up. Of its order denying dismissal of the case and disqualification of the Fulton County DA Big Fanny. Now the motion that we're going to read through notes that the court found that Willis's actions created an appearance of impropriety and a quote odor of mendacity, an odor of lies, and a stinky odor at that, that lingers in this case, noxious, putrid, but it nonetheless refused to dismiss the case or to disqualify her. Yeah, it's really weird. It's like, hey, Fanny's a big liar, but she can stay as long as another liar leaves. You go, what? Steve says, the motion further notes that the court found Georgia case law lacks controlling precedent for the standard for disqualification of a prosecuting attorney for forensic misconduct, right? And the judge, we talked a lot about this. We drew the check boxes on the chart, on the PDF. You know, what's the standard? What do they have to check? And then once they know what they have to check, what is the burden of proof, whether it's clear and convincing evidence or preponderance of the evidence, which is below that or higher than that, which would be beyond a reasonable doubt. And we were, you know, playing around with all these rules. And so they're saying, well, the judge said, we don't really know what the rules are. And since it's a matter of first impression, we are now appealing this or asking the judge to certify to give them permission to pause the criminal trial and knock this thing up at a level. The court order is ripe for pretrial appellate review. And so that is from Steve Sadow. Now, before we get into this, because Steve Sadow is going to bring up an interesting point about some of her forensic misconduct, about how this stuff has actually mattered. Okay, why what Fannie has done is already causing bias and prejudice in this case. So here is a little bit of background on what's going on there in Atlanta. So as you'll see, the Atlanta Journal Constitution, I'm always curious, what do the local people say? You know, we're here from afar. I'm in Arizona, man. I'm on the other shoulder of the country, the other knee. And we are seeing all of this play out on TV, on the screen, on the court live streams, or we're watching. We say, this is pretty dang egregious. You know, if this was our county attorney, if this was the person who was responsible for law enforcement, essentially, of your county as the DA and a bunch of other things, wouldn't you be kind of grossed out? by this reprehensible conduct? Wouldn't you be kind of upset that your DA and her lover were cavorting around on cruises, going to Belize, Napa Valley, and all these other places on the taxpayer dime? I would. So the question is, right, what do the local media say? Because apparently there's a lot of pressure there. Judge McAfee, man, got squeezed into a pretzel. He's like, I'm gonna go, you know, I can't wait to tell my kids what an honorable judge I am, full of integrity. Then he starts his opinion from a false timeline and ignores all of the perjury claims that were in front of his courtroom. You're like, what? So when his kids, you know, are dishonest, honest with him about where they were that Saturday night when they were in high school, you know? It's like, Dad, I'm just following your precedent. I thought that lying to you was okay. That's gonna be brutal. Dad, I thought we're allowed to lie to you. Fanny did, got away with it. Boom! 
Enigma. Drops the mic and walks out of there. <laughs> Man, Daddy McAfee's in trouble when that happens. So anyways, apparently in Atlanta, they are just loving it. You know, there's really no problem with any of this. So front page Atlanta is what this looks like. So everyone wakes up there after the order comes out from McAfee. From today's front page, key moments that shape Fulton's bare knuckle disqualification brawl. This is what it says. No conflict of interest, but a quote lapse in judgment, right? So if you're waking up, you're in there, you know, in Atlanta, Fulton County, I wonder what's going on with this. Shout out to Ashley Merchant, defense attorney extraordinaire. Says DA Fanny stepped onto the stage at a ballroom at the Ritz Carlton <laughs> with a swagger that made it seem like she had not a care in the world. Probably drunk on goose. It was just days before a Fulton County judge was slated to announce whether he would remove her from one of the biggest cases her office had ever pursued. One that charged the former president of the United States with trying to overthrow the 2020 election. And the legal and political quandary was the result of Willis's romance with a subordinate, which had exploded into a full-blown scandal that threatened to derail the case. All right, so, you know, they're going to go through. They've already got the story. Nathan Wade resigned his position, and the whole thing is kind of in cleanup mode, right? Not so fast. This is going up on appeal, and McAfee's going to have to see what the higher court does with this. You know, they should laugh at it, honestly, but we'll see what happens there. So Ashley Merchant was there. She's the one who busted the lid off the whole thing. And so, you know, kind of a neutral headline, nothing anything that is too egregious one way or the other. But 11 Alive had this report and they were explaining what some local people thought there, including this guy. So two different people responding to this. One is going to be this guy who is apparently a law professor. I don't know what he teaches or, you know, good luck to those kids, those students. But he's there and he's reacting to this and he's saying, you know, the judge was a little bit harsh on Fanny. He shouldn't have called out her church speech, which we're going to hear about in a minute because the church speech was something that actually had impact. The gentleman that we're going to hear at the end of this clip says, yeah, I listened to the church speech and it really mattered to me, right? And we're going to put a pin in that and then see what Steve Sadow says about that in their appeal filing. Here is what 11 Alive said. I was surprised that he admonished her for what she said at the church because it wasn't what? directly about these defendants. Associate Professor John Acevedo. That's the most ridiculous thing you've ever heard. It wasn't about these defendants? What other cases is Nathan Wade prosecuting? What other cases was a motion filed that alleged that Fannie was having intercourse with her subordinate? Was there another case that we missed? If there was, I'd like to cover it. I don't think there was another case. So everything that Fanny said was about Nathan Wade, where the only allegation, there was, literally was no other case. It could have only been the Nathan Wade case because the special counsel case, because he was the special counsel. What other cases were there? Like it's the only case it could be, law professor. Emory University says Judge Scott McAfee's criticism of comments Fulton County DA Fonnie Willis made at Big Bethel Church wasn't necessary, but he does admire the way the judge ruled. The judge ruling Willis could stay on the election interference case if special prosecutor Nathan Wade stepped down after defense attorneys alleged Willis and Wade were romantically involved and had financially benefited from Willis's appointing Wade to the case. I think the decision really reflects his desire to end distractions in this case. Parishioner Keith Burnett agrees McAfee's decision to allow Willis to remain was fair. Okay, Big Bethel, African Methodist Episcopal Church. Okay, now listen to this guy. Apparently he was very moved by Fanny. I felt like his decision was spot on because the people on the other side made it a moral thing and it wasn't a moral thing. Well, it kind of was though because she was sleeping with her subordinate. There was a conflict of interest there. They lied about their relationship. It happened in 2019 when they met at CLE convention for judges. They put their robes on and their gavels and they got after it there. And that was all covered up. Then there was witness tampering. She lied in her affidavit. She lied in her public disclosure forms. He lied in his interrogatories. They lied to the judge. They compelled Terrence Bradley to lie. That's kind of a moral thing. You know, it's dishonesty through and through. So that's why the other side brought it up. Now you have questions about that. The conflict of interest, of course, is monetary. It is pecuniary. It goes from the taxpayers into the fund that is supposed to be used for lawful, legitimate prosecutions. And then from Fannie discretion into Nathan Wade's pockets. And she gets benefits from that because he traveled with her, paid for expenses with actual money, and then indicted her, presumably, on the cruise ships. And that's a benefit, probably, you know, for This was honored back in January as part of the church's annual Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. celebration service and used her time in the pulpit to address the congregation yes, about the did. hearing and challenges she's faced both personally and professionally. I appointed three special counsel as is my right to do, paid them all the same hourly rate. No, you did not. One was 150, the next was 250. So that's a lie, Fanny. They only 
tell you one. The one you slept with. Burnett was there the day Willis's speech was delivered. Okay, Burnett was there the day the speech was delivered by Fannie. Okay, he heard this. Listen to him. He's an average juror in Georgia. Verdon says he was moved by it. The fact is, she talked about demons. She talked about darkness. And she talked about the fact that she's doing her job. And she did everything she could in her power to pick the right people. In his ruling, the judge yeah. wrote that Willis's comments at the church about the case were legally improper and warned of a potential gag order against her in the future. Hours after the judge issued his ruling Friday, giving Willis the choice to stay on the case if Wade stepped down, Wade resigned. He did resign, so obviously that was impactful to him, right? He said that she was talking about demons. She was calling people racist. She was talking about how God was on her side and how she was doing the right thing. And everyone else was just trying to detract from this, saying that everyone else was dishonest. Ashley Merchant was dishonest and the co-defendants who joined in on the claim were dishonest. All of that, of course, is not true at all. Fanny was the one who was dishonest and apparently she can get away with it. Fulton County, you can do whatever you want all the time with no consequences. This is what the filing looks like. The case is Big Fanny Willis versus Donald Trump and the other co-defendants. You see seven of them listed here. All of them have committed no crimes and certainly less misconduct or even alleged misconduct than Fanny Willis has in her felonious perjury that she committed in open court in front of all of America to see. No one on this list did anything like that. So Trump plus the seven as co-defendants submit this one Fulton County in front of Judge Matt. McAfee, the case, we are at a procedural posture where McAfee has just ruled that Fannie Willis is not being disqualified. Fannie Willis can stay provided Nathan Wade goes and resigns. That's already been done. And so Fannie's back on the case. And as far as we know, she's not inclined to go anywhere. Now, a lot of people on the left, even guys like Andrew Weissman on MSNBC, Saki's favorite, he's saying, you know, she should voluntarily recuse herself because this is not going to be good for them, right? Not only did the judge say in his order that actually allowed Fannie to stay on the case, that she has an odor of mendacity, very stinky, noxious breath of lies, but that there was further justification for investigating this in other avenues, in other forums. And so Fanny is not out of the woods yet, right? She's gonna be latched onto this case because in many ways, this is her salvation. It's both her potential pitfalls and end, but it's also her salvation. She's gonna ride this to victory and show how oppressed she's been throughout this entire you know, prosecution. So with that in mind, now Steve Sadow and the Trump defense and co-defendants, they all submit this this, their joint motion for a certificate of immediate review to Judge McAfee saying, sorry, judge, your opinion needs to be appealed. It's not so good. Here's who's joining. Defendants, President Donald Trump, Rudy Giuliani, Mark Meadows, Robert Cheely, Michael Roman, who initiated most of this, David Schaefer, Harrison Floyd, and Kathleen Latham. They all filed this joint motion for a certificate of immediate review. And they request that you, Judge Scott, grant a certificate on our motion to dismiss and to disqualify Big Fanny Willis so that we can take it up to the Georgia Court of Appeals. They say, all right, judge, the March 15th order that you excremented out of your body of exceptionally great importance to this case, substantially impacting the defense and their rights to due process. And additionally, given the lack of guidance from the appellate courts on key issues that we discussed here, and the fact that any errors in the March 15th order could be structural errors that would necessitate a retrial, right? The last thing the court wants to do is have a retrial of this case, you know, with 19 co-defendants originally. The grant of a certificate of immediate review is both prudent and warranted. So before we take this thing to trial, let us make sure that we're on the right path. Let's make sure that a court of appeals is not going to say that, oops, sorry, Judge McAfee, you made a problem and Fanny needs to be dismissed. If they say that Fanny can stay, okay, then we can just put the trial back on path. But if we go to trial and then we find out that Fanny needs to go, then we will have essentially been prejudiced because we will have gone through this process and there's an adversarial process happening here that's keeping Trump from the campaign trail, costing him a ton of money and all this stuff. And we could have just litigated this right now and decided. So McAfee says, here's what Sado says. In its order, the court found that DA Fannie and her actions had created an appearance of impropriety. That was, he says, yes. And that it had an odor of mendacity that lingers in this case, as well as the continuing possibility that, quote, an outsider like you or I could reasonably think that Fannie is not exercising her her independent professional judgment, totally free of any compromising influences. Now, I think the judge would respond to this and they would say, well, now she is, okay, right now, she is exercising her independent professional judgment, free of compromising influences. The judge will say, we solved for this, right? We already fixed this. But the point is, I think that Steve's gonna make is that this was the situation at the time of the judge's order. Now, despite this, right, the judge found all of that. We could all reasonably believe that at the inception
inception of this case, Fannie's judgment could be questioned despite all of that possibility, the court still declined to disqualify Fannie, finding that eliminating only Wade could cure the lingering appearance of impropriety and that disgusting, noxious odor. Now, defendants, the co-defendants signed here, believe that the relevant case law requires the dismissal of the case, or at the very least, the disqualification of Fannie and her entire office under the facts that exist here. And the resignation of Mr. Wade is insufficient to cure the appearance of impropriety that the court has already determined exists. In your own ruling, Judge, you said there was an appearance of impropriety. You said we couldn't come to the determination about whether there was an actual conflict. Remember, those were the two standards. Appearance of impropriety would be on the lower part of the spectrum, but actual conflict, right, an actual bias. He says, well, it wasn't really shown because Fanny kind of said she paid him back. And Nathan Wade said this, and they all said this, and Yuri, you know, he gave like a sentence to. So he kind of skipped over that, but they say, sorry, Judge, even if we're going to go with your garbage ruling and you say it's not actual conflict, but you drop it down, even if it's the appearance of impropriety, you got the solution and the remedy wrong. You missed it. So given these facts and the current state of the case law, the Court of Appeals should speak definitively to this outcome determinative issue now, right? If we decide this, the case is closed. If Fannie is disqualified, this whole prosecution might go away, might be deviated significantly. It's going to determine the outcome. Now, if you allow this case to proceed with a corrupt prosecutor, that could continue to pervert justice throughout the remainder of this. Like, this is necessary before we can continue on. So here is what Sadow says. Now, the court, you, Judge McAfee, you also found that Fannie Willis and her nationally televised speech at Big Bethel Church on June 14th, you said it was legally improper. We have that in a footnote from you that you wrote, says, but you still declined to disqualify her on the basis of this forensic misconduct and the other forensic misconduct that we proved as well, noting in particular a lack of guidance in Georgia case law. The judge said, I don't know what the rules are. I don't know what the standards are for disqualifying a prosecuting attorney in forensic misconduct. And we spent a lot of time at this at the hearing, a lot of back Back and forth, Adam Abate, remember him, with his PowerPoints, walking us through those one by one, going through the various case law, and there was nothing on point. We've never had a situation where Big Fanny, someone like her, has done something so egregiously corrupt. Not in Georgia. So here is what they said. As best as it can divine, the court said, under the sole direction of Williams, that case, the court cannot find that this speech crossed the line. So the judge is hanging his hat on this one case, and he says, although it was legally improper, it didn't cross the line of disqualification. He also said, the judge, unmoored from precedent, if I don't have something to measure my decision, my ruling against, the court feels confined to the boundaries of Williams, again, that original case, and restricts the application of the facts here to its limited holding. Now, based on the holding in Williams versus State, says Sadow, and he's actually, let's pause and just go down to this footnote. So, prosecutorial misconduct, right? Fanny gets up there, she is now lecturing everybody about the racists and about the misogynists and about the you know, basically demons, people who are anti-God working against her on her righteous path. That's misconduct. We're asking, can the judge disqualify her based on that speech? He says, I just have this one case of Williams. This one case Williams kind of applies, but here's what it says. It's limited. The law review talking about Williams note cited favorably by the court in Williams. It defines forensic. So now we're like multiple layers deep or like inception. So now Williams, this case law is also citing a law review article. Wall away. Now, the law review articles like, you know, CNN article, but they can be very, very big, like studies, theses on major areas of the law. So the court cited this law review article, defines forensic misconduct much more broadly than the facts in the William case itself, stating that, quote, the prosecutor's forensic misconduct may be generally defined as any activity by the prosecutor, which tends to divert the jury from making its determination of guilt or innocence by weighing the legally admitted evidence in the manner prescribed by the law. Hmm. So how about that guy we just listened to from the news segment when he was out there saying, I was in church, I heard it. She was talking about demons. She was talking about morality, right? She was lifting herself up, prejudicing the entire jury pool to be on her favor, to divert the jury from making its own determination of guilt or innocence by weighing the legally admitted evidence. No, the legally admitted evidence comes in through the court, not through Fanny's big mouth in church where she lectures everybody, even though she had relationship with a man who was married. So now we see what we're relying on. And so now what they're doing 
doing, and I think this is important to really take time on this, is because they're showing that Judge McAfee's holding, which is based on Williams, is actually not that great. Okay, Williams was relying on some of this law review stuff, but this law review stuff, if you dig into that, they actually are saying, Judge, that article is actually more in alignment with our perspective. It's pretty loose standard. If it tends to divert the jury from making its own determination, you gotta go. So it's like, Judge, if you relied on Williams to not get rid of Fannie, you did that incorrectly, okay? Because Williams, if you actually read the law review article that they reference in the opinion, it's even broader. So had you actually gone all the multiple layers deep there, Judge McAfee, you probably would have come back out and agreed with us. So he says, okay, based on the holdings in Williams versus State and the other persuasive authorities from the U.S. Supreme Court and other jurisdictions cited to the court on forensic misconduct, however, they say it is likely that the Georgia appellate courts would decide that Fannie and her forensic misconduct requires her disqualification in this case. So just kind of showing that the judge's authority, right? So Williams versus State is coming from the Georgia, it looks like, Supreme Court. So we have different types of authority in the law. We have binding authority and persuasive authority. Binding authority is stuff that comes from a higher level court. So for example, you might have the Georgia or you know Superior Court, then you might have the Court of Appeals, then you might have the Supreme Court in a state. This is in a state. So we're in Fulton County Superior Court right now with Judge McAfee. We are trying to go to the Court of Appeals to get a decision on what some of the rules say. Now they're referencing this state case from Georgia, it looks like Supreme Court, which is the highest level. And so that is the only binding authority because anything that is straight down on this vertical, the Superior Court is bound by the Court of Appeals, which is bound by the Supreme Court. So we're all bound this way. So the only one case that the judge relied on is not even good because it relies on a law review article that is more broad than what the judge says Williams stands for. Now you see this other word persuasive here. So persuasive means, let's say that there is a another state, like let's say they're taking a case from, you know, from Florida, one state over. So they go over to Florida and the Florida Supreme Court also says something, but this is not binding on Georgia, right? Florida to Georgia is not binding. Florida's opinion would only be binding on their court of appeals and their superior court. So in other words, what they're telling us is that you have nothing to rely on, okay? Your persuasive authorities are from the US Supreme Court and other jurisdictions and the Supreme Court would be binding obviously, but they're not on point. So they're just persuasive authority, right? In other words, Judge McAfee, you're not bound to follow them. So you're boxing yourself in unnecessarily. They're persuasive and you're just falling in line or you're following this Williams case, which is not even really supposed to be followed. So it's a bad case on its legal foundation. Now at a minimum, the factual findings of the court, and there's a lot packed into that one paragraph, but at minimum, the factual findings of the court and the lack of the appellate guidance from the Georgia courts on the issue, they weigh heavily in favor of immediate appellate review as well, Judge, especially given that the failure to disqualify a prosecutor who should be disqualified is a structural error that could necessitate a retrial without any additional showing of prejudice. Here's a Georgia case. This one stands for a prosecutor to have a conflict of interest. It's contrary to public policy, cannot have a conflict, and it could warrant a new trial. And again, nobody wants to do that again. Another case from Georgia says erroneous deprivation of counsel, if you deny someone their attorney, is quote, a structural error, one that affects the framework within the trial proceeds, right? So the trial cannot be governed or handled appropriately if the prosecutor is corrupt. So we need to decide this. And it requires an appellate court to reverse any conviction that follows without any inquiry into harm or prejudice. Now seeking clear direction from the appellate courts, this is Sadow and team writing, on these critical issues at this pretrial juncture is a compelling and an immediate interest. So we need it. They say the immediate appellate review is also needed of the March 15th order, declining to disqualify Fannie based upon the personal stake that she has acquired in this prosecution both through her actual conflicts of interest and the appearance of impropriety created by her actions. Now, specifically, the Georgia appellate courts in applying their relevant precedent, including McLaughlin, would likely determine, if we go up on appeal, Judge McAfee, they would likely determine that the disqualification of Fannie is required when she has acquired a personal stake in the prosecution by either one of these things, laboring under an actual conflict of interest, including non-pecuniary actual conflicts, which we believe is the defense we've actually established, or by creating the appearance of impropriety that this court has already determined she has created and remains here, or by creating the appearance of impropriety that this court has already determined or has created remains here. So there are two ways this court of appeals could go. One is they say, yeah, Fanny, you were sleeping with your subordinate and getting money and you made an appearance in his wife's divorce case. So there was an actual conflict of interest here and you were working together for over two years on this. So yeah, that's standard is 
met. And they say, judge, even though you didn't find that that standard was met, you did find that there was an appearance of impropriety. And we think that if this goes back up to the court of appeals, they'll also check that box or they'll have an option to pick either one. And you've already decided there was an appearance of impropriety. So this is it. Pick one. Either way you pick, you lose. So Steve Sadow wraps it up. In conclusion, he says, a criminal defendant is entitled to a disinterested prosecutor, citing a U.S. Supreme Court case. If the assigned prosecutor has acquired a personal interest or stake in the conviction, the trial court abuses its discretion denying a motion to disqualify her. And again, they said that like Fannie needed to be walking out of the courtroom with a big fat check. Obviously not. It's consortium. It's her boyfriend traveling around with her, working with her, going to weekly meetings with her, RICO meetings, mm -hmm. and then also spending money on her that was coming through her appointment. Now, certificates of immediate review, say the defense, have been granted by courts under similar circumstances here before, Judge. In this case called Registe versus State in 2010, they granted a defense motion for a certificate of immediate review. Again, pausing a criminal case. We don't have appeals in the middle of criminal courts regularly, but they granted one following the court's disqualification of the defendant's counsel. There was another case in Georgia, State versus Cook, where the defense was granted a certificate of review from denial of a motion to disqualify two special assistant DAs. That's a good case. So that one's from Georgia Court of Appeals. And then this one, State versus Montooth, another Georgia Court of Appeals, it granted an interlocutory review following the trial court's grant of motion to recuse a DeKalb County Solicitor General. So interlocutory, right? We're in the middle of something and appealing up to the next level court because we can't continue on at the lower level until we satisfy that. So Sadow continues, he says, whether Fannie and her office are permitted to continue representing Georgia in prosecuting the defense in this action is of the utmost importance to this case and ensuring that the appellate courts have the opportunity to weigh in on these matters pre-trial is paramount. As noted, should such a review not occur until after any trial in this case occurs and these decisions were ultimately reversed on appeal, such reversal would likely require the retrial of every convicted defendant without any additional showing of error or prejudice. So let's say that Fannie goes forward, we get to trial date, she gets convictions on appeal after the trial, right? Presuming that they lose. I mean, if they win, that's the end of the story. But if they lose, then they would appeal it. And then at that time, they would say, we would automatically be granted an appellate rights, automatically win and get a new trial based on the standard. So remember, we had this big distinction between pre-trial and post-trial disqualification, whether somebody's actually convicted, what the standards are on appeal. So they say, look, I mean, if we go all the way back down and we actually get convicted and we have to appeal this, we're going to win and it's going to cause us to do this all over again. So just stop it right now, meaning we have to do this all over again with a new prosecutor, right? Obviously, Fannie would be disqualified. So that, no, sorry, Fannie was corrupt. If she lied about Nathan, if she perjured herself in court, if she has an odor of mendacity in this case, we think she's just going to go step outside for a minute and air out? No, like that odor of mendacity is going to continue throughout the remainder of the case, which is why she's got to go. Even the judge admitted that. So they take this up on appeal. They say, hey, Court of Appeals, we got an odor of mendacity after the conviction. And they say, you're right. She should have been gone. Do it again. Judge McAfee, do it again. It's like, okay, definitely don't want to do that. So rather than doing that, why don't we just stop it right now and go up? They also say this, given the length and the complexity of the trials in this case, should the current indictment survive such that any such trials are even possible? Neither the court nor the parties should run an unnecessary risk of having to go through that process more than once. And so Sadow, lead counsel for Trump, says for all these reasons, defendants Trump, Rudy, Meadows, Robert Cheeley, Michael Roman, David Schaefer, Harrison Floyd, Latham, they respectfully request that the court grant immediate review, a certificate of immediate review, and allow us to basically pause this case, take it up to the Court of Appeals pursuant to Georgia law, signed by Jennifer Sadow and Jennifer Little, counsel for Trump, along with everyone else. We got attorneys for Giuliani are on here, Mark Meadows attorney, James Durham, shout out, John Esposito, shout out, Christopher Anowitz, Rice is there, Ashley Merchant from the Merchant Law Firm in the house, Craig Gillen, we saw many of these people appear, Holly Pearson, Todd Harding, Christopher Kacheroff, and Cromwell, all signing this and submitting it to Judge McAfee. So, of course, Fannie Willis will respond and say, no, none of this is necessary, and oppose this, and then we'll see what Judge McAfee does. I think he needs to grant this. I think even he said in his own filing that he wasn't real sure what the standard was, and so we're going to have to hang our hat on other areas of the law, persuasive law and stuff that is kind of on the mark, like that Williams case, which was maybe a binding case, but not something that was necessarily very 
full of on point material. And so we've got some reaction to this. We're going to hear from MSNBC, Alina Abba, of course. They were all commenting on the judge's opinion. And we also have this story about Nathan Wade, who actually canceled an interview right after the order came out. But here's what MSNBC said about this opinion right after it dropped. And there was a question about whether they were creating out of this court, out of Scott McAfee's courtroom, a solution that would not impact other cases throughout Fulton County. Here's what MSNBC, when they were talking about the McAfee decision. For example, being an odor of mendacity remains. Did McAfee consider in any way, do you think, the impact that that type of finding could have other cases that Fonnie Willis is prosecuting in Fulton County? Well, he certainly should have. I mean, this is a high media interest case. The judge should have known that anything that he wrote in his opinion would be disseminated. You know, people who viewed the testimony yeah. in this case viewed it differently. The judge has his view. He's entitled to his view. The reality here is that the trial is months away at a minimum, if not longer than that. It's unlikely that... The not longer than that? Yeah, like in the next year? Or longer like not this year? Like not before the election? And if McAfee does grant the appeal, well, Trump's going to make the same argument that everything needs to stop at the lower level superior court. So the clock will just continue to tick away. This language will linger in the minds of jurors. You know, we are hyper-focused on the news in this moment, but people tend to forget over time. So at the end of the day, I don't think this impacts the ability of prosecutors and defendants to select a fair jury. But overall, this really became a sideshow. It became a real debacle. And looking at it in hindsight, it's possible that Willis could have cut it all off by filing in response to the defendant's initial motion, acknowledging the relationship, saying it wasn't and a conflict of interest. Himself. But like everything else involving Trump, and I think this is an important point, this is something that's been blown out of focus for political purposes by defendants in a way that judges wouldn't tolerate in a normal course, in the ordinary course of business. And it's a cautionary tale for every prosecutor who's Give involved a in a case against Trump. They have to be prepared to move their case forward as prosecutors do, focused on the best interests of the case while trying to minimize the sideshow. What is she talking about? Prosecutors should be aware. Prosecutors should be advised. Don't indulge in the sideshow. Don't sleep with your subordinates is I think what you're saying. Is that right? We would agree with that. Like, don't be corrupt scumbag prosecutors and you won't have a sideshow to indulge in. That's the point. Fanny caused it. If she would have kept it in her pants, nobody would be here, but she couldn't help herself. All right, so that's MSNBC. Now, speaking of people who can't help themselves, here was Nathan Wade, and I was pretty excited about this over the weekend. I thought, oh my gosh, this guy's so dumb. He's going to show up on the media. Wow. This was what came out on the 16th. I think this was a Saturday. Tomorrow on Meet the Press. Whoa, an announcement. Kristen Welker has an exclusive interview with Nathan Wade, former Fulton County Special Prosecutor Nathan Wade. Oh my gosh. And look at the headshot they used for this guy. That's the headshot that we use in the thumbnails because he looks so miserable. That's the one that I put next to Fanny Willis when I'm trying to make him look like, you know, I definitely should not have done this, you know? So I was pretty excited about this. I was excited to see him come out here and give his talk, give his little speech about what a victim he is and about how horrendous the MAGA crew is. But look what happened. We fast forward just a short time later. When did he post this? 2.07 p.m. And then later this evening, oh no. So that was at the original post. And then at 7.09 p.m., so five hours later, they say, womp, womp, not gonna happen. Nathan Wade this afternoon confirmed an in-person interview on our broadcast tomorrow morning. Late this evening, he is canceled, citing a family emergency. Fanny's family? or Jocelyn and the actual kids. I don't know. The original broadcast lineup with Ben Cardin, Ben Cassidy, and Jose Andres will proceed as planned. So what happened? He got a phone call from Fanny. Don't you dare go on MSNBC or NBC. He got a phone call, right? Probably a text message from Big Fanny. Anyway, so he did not show up, obviously, and probably a good call for him. We've got the left is melting down over Trump. They're just having a difficult time with all of this. But Byron Donalds is saying that that maybe Fanny and Nathan are still in some serious hot water because we know that the J6 committee back channeled and colluded with 
Fannie Willis. Here's our friend Byron Donalds over on with Newsmax. We're finding out that A, the January 6th committee deleted information. They got rid of information True. they collected. True. You're finding out now that Cassidy Hutchison was spun up by Liz Cheney Liar. and others to deliver a phony story that was debunked. Lies. We already knew that the whole J6 production was just a media sham and a farce for the radical left. We already knew that. True. But now you know that they were meeting with Fannie Willis and her team trying to give back channel information to the Fulton County District Attorney, who, by the way, is having all kind of problems herself. They were back channeling information to her. This demonstrates very clearly that you had congressional Democrats and some useful Republicans. Unfortunately, they did the wrong thing and it was terrible. That's why they're no longer in Congress. Speaking to Liz Cheney specifically, Bye, Liz. working with radical Democrats, working with some of these prosecutors, the entire purpose has been to get Trump. It is wrong. This is fascism at its finest. This is what we're seeing right now. It's destructive of our institutions. So this stuff can't be tolerated. Nice little segment there from Byron. And he's absolutely right. J6 committee just threatened Fannie with some more inquisition. If she does not respond to them, said, you know, we're going to go forward with our subpoena and hold you in contempt of Congress if you don't comply. But Byron lays out a nice litany of all of the various Trump operations that are currently underway to try to take him out. And then people like Mika will come out and they'll call him the dictator. They'll say he likes dictators. And we're sitting here going, what? What kind of political leader prosecutes their political opponents and orchestrates it in four different locations? New York, Georgia, Florida, and DC. What kind of a government creates fake show trial committees that don't even follow their own rules like an HR 503, the J6 committee I think is completely not even legitimate according to their own founding document. That's dictatorship. When you have the FBI censoring people's first amendment by coercing the social media companies to eliminate your voice during the 2020 election. But anyways, the point is we have a list that could go on and on. This is what they sound like over there and I play these just because it's almost wild to watch. So here is Mika Brzezinski. This is what she was saying. We'll just listen to a short bit of this so that we can make sure our tolerance levels are exercised today. Michael Beschloss, I want to ask you about Donald Trump increasingly sounding like a fascist, a dictator, mimicking them and using words that are clearly out of the pages of some of the most powerful autocrats or dictators Absolutely. of our time Spit it out, in actually. the world. I guess the fear is that for some Americans who may not be informed about history, inform us. there's that vulnerability that Trump preys upon. Hmm. And then and there are those who are making the choice and I need to understand that is there any precedent or is this how fascism works are they sucked in and brought in on different terms whether Trump has something on some Republican leaders or others are just so uninformed <laughs> they don't care is it a mixture how does it work is there a precedent can you please explain how insane my opponents are after she just gets done after a full minute there on some bizarre rambling screed about how much Trump likes dictators. It's going to be a bloodbath out there, says Mika. Okay. All right. So that's what they sound like. Now, here's Alina Abba who says, you know what? When Trump wins, there are going to be Trump repercussions, obviously. I mean, Barack Obama taught us all this. You know, elections have consequences and there are repercussions for how you vote. And so let's get this clip queued up. Alina Abba, one of Trump's attorneys, showed up to have a conversation about this and was asked about the fallout from McAfee's ruling. And here's what Alina Abba had to say. The legal situation I'm having shouldn't exist no matter who's sleeping with who. Let's start there, Jesse. We all know that. I think that the fanfare and the craziness that Miss Fannie Willis has brought to the table with Mr. Wade has been quite honestly entertaining but distracting from the key fact of the case, which is that President Trump did not do anything wrong. This case was brought clearly by selective prosecution, persecution, and only for election interference. We see that now. What's more troubling today is that, you know, this judge we have has, as you said, hunted. He allowed an out, but that doesn't mean that the case should still stand. We had three counts dismissed against President Trump, three counts dismissed against another defendant. And that was a great start. But let's not deny what's happened here, Jesse. This case was brought intentionally this year. It's old as can be, just like Stormy Daniels, just like a lot of these cases that we've seen that are witch hunts, to stop Trump from campaigning. So while I appreciate all of it, and it is quite entertaining, I'll give you that. I don't disagree agree with you. I That's think that true. we can't be distracted from the fact that this case entirely should be thrown out. Miss Willis is clearly compromised. The taxpayers should be outraged in the state of Georgia and they should take action against her. When we eventually see these text messages, and I believe we will see them, and they show yeah. Fannie and her lover conniving maliciously
actually prosecuting Donald Trump, doing it for fame, doing it for fortune. And witness tampering. Doing it without any sort of judicial integrity. What does that tell you, not just about this case, what does it tell you about all of the cases? First, let's start. Miss Willis went into a church, a religious house. If anybody has any morals or moral compass, how dare you go into a religious house and cry racism? That, to me, was the lowest point of all of this, I have to be honest with you, no matter Why, what those texts God? say. And I'm sure we'll see what Why? they say, and they will say what we think. How does it relate to all these cases? I hope it opens the door, Jesse, to us looking at all the DAs, all the AGs, communications between the White House, the yeah. administration, and collusion between all of them. In bringing these cases the same year, even though some of these cases are years and years and years old, had no investigation or investigations for years and then waited until he was the candidate, an obvious candidate for the Republican Party and nominee. So I would like it to open the door. I hope we get those texts, but let's look into everything. I fear that we can't do that until we have a different administration in place. Of course. But more importantly, it's time for the American people to see the corruption I've seen, the destruction I've seen to the judicial system. It is deep. They are coordinating. And there is no question that her texts with Mr. Wade are just the beginning. Let's get them. Yeah, she can't prosecute Trump in the same courtroom that she perjured herself in. When you do get a new administration, yeah. if Donald Trump does win in November, Here it comes. would you suggest he look into all of these prosecutions, seize their phones? These are government phones. If you have a subpoena, you should be able to see what they're writing. You should be able to see what they're texting, what they're emailing. Goes. That would really uncover some of the illegal and prosecutorial misconduct, which we believe has happened. Would you suggest he do that? I suggest you absolutely dig deep and clean house, number one. Number two, more importantly, Jesse, I'm clean exhausted house. of seeing so many subpoenas come out. People come testify in front of Congress and then nothing happens. I want to see action. I want to see people be held accountable for real crimes, not this fake stuff that has to do with politics. I'm not saying you go after one side over the other. I'm saying clean house. There is no room for politics at all in the judicial system. I am a lawyer. It shouldn't matter whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. Our legal system, our constitution are, is about America, period. So I would absolutely recommend that we take a look, clean up, and start from the top. Woo! Alina! Amazing. Okay. That's Alina Abba in the house. Donald Trump's defense attorney saying the truth, exactly what needs to happen. Corruption, liars, perjurers, felonious witness tamperers, all exist throughout DA's offices all across America in large quantity, however, in Fulton County. And so I think it is time for a return to justice and Trump is the man leading the way there. So Fanny, not out yet. The appeal has been filed. Of course, we're going to be here continuing to cover it. We're expecting Fanny to file a response in opposition to this. And then we'll see what Judge McAfee does. We're keeping our eyes on all of the Georgia filings and all of the other criminal cases and civil cases and Supreme Court cases involving Trump and 2024. And we'd love it if you joined us as we continued on in our journey here. Thank you for subscribing and liking this video wherever it is you're watching it. Thanks for inviting someone else that you know or love to come and join us for our daily live streams. And don't forget to check out some of the links in the description below. We've got robertcovea.com where the PDF that we just read through will be located. We have our newsletter there. We have watchingthewatchers.locals.com, which is our members only community. So if you want to join us for morning streams or Saturday streams, that's the place to do it. And we'll see you right back here on the next one.